Well, consumers over the years have always changed, but I think over the last 18 months we've seen more change than we have for a considerable amount of time, and clearly that's due to um, the economic climate that we find ourselves in. And I am talking with John Gersmer, who is the Chief Insights Officer of Young and Rubicon, and John's joining me on the line from New York. John, a very uh, warm welcome. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. John, you've been doing quite a lot of work looking at the US consumer and how the current events are reshaping the way in which the consumer is feeling and clearly then the way in which they are uh, reacting and acting and spending or not spending their money. What insights can you provide to us on the way in which this change is beginning to manifest itself in the way in which uh, consumers uh, are feeling? David, I guess one of the things that we're finding is that we're seeing a fundamental shift in consumer values and behaviors in America, things that we think are going to represent a pendulum shift to some more of a really foundational, more longer lasting shifts in terms of America's attitudes toward consumption. And I guess maybe to kind of put it into perspective, you have to step back and think that 80% of all Americans were born after World War II. So for all intents and purposes, this was really our recession. It was quite difficult you know, to fathom the loss of you know, over um, $3 trillion in household values, uh, the decline of 45% of equity values. So in that context, you're seeing some really dramatic uh, consumer behaviors out there and things that are shifting. Um, you know, maybe I can talk a little bit about that, but I guess there's probably three core things that are happening. One is that you do have this dramatic need to repair wealth in America, whereas Americans have to absolutely save more and spend less. We saw in the fourth quarter spending decline almost by 4.3%. It was a record over 62 years. And savings now have reached 6.8% uh, as they start to work their way back up to 10%. That was the normal uh, sort of pattern in America up until 1981 before the debt-fueled consumption binge started. And lastly is the, is the sort of ever-looming threat of unemployment. Now, you probably have seen in the papers that unemployment has gone down from 9.5% to 9.4%, but the consensus experts from the Philadelphia Fed to others really forecast you know, a forward-looking anemic growth and potential of a jobless recovery. And when you do look at the data, you see the statistics that show that the peak to trough recovery in jobs you know, range from you know, months to, if not years, to get back to the place that we were before this crisis began. So those really three things, loss of equity values, needing to repair wealth, the focus on um, concerns for unemployment in, in the marketplace and really have consumers in a different place. I know we throw away sort of terms like, you know, we're used to talking about billions, now we're talking about trillions. And sometimes it's difficult to imagine what a trillion is. And uh, I think, you know, if, uh, if you'd spent a million pounds every day since Christ was born, you still wouldn't have spent a trillion uh, 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 dollars or pounds. I think you've probably got another 230 years to go before you actually reach a trillion. So these numbers are vast, aren't they? They're absolutely staggering. And it points to the fact that, that America, and by default, you know, America's public debt and its private debt is astronomical. Uh, I saw the other day there was this sort of reference that one trillion seconds equates to 32,000 years. And I think it's a staggering amount of, of perspective of quantity of something when you think about it. So I think you have to kind of put those numbers into some sort of awe and understand that America is essentially, you know, over leveraged. It's over consumed. It's driven itself to the precipice of this sort of great recession that we're now referring to it. And as a result, consumers are going to have to unwind their leverage, unwind their debt, as America will have to do the same. So with that in place, even if consumers wanted to go back to the way that they were before, there's lots of signals to suggest it's going to be very difficult for them. So even if the desire was there, 
uh, the means may not be. And so with that respect, you know, we're seeing some shifts. I guess before we get deeper into it, David, I do want to say that this is not about the consumer being in retreat. We're not looking at a prolonged period of, of sort of sustained rational behavior or that consumers aren't going to cherish brands. I mean, that's not the case at all. But what is going to happen, I believe, is that consumers are going to move from mindless consumption to mindful consumption. So their consumption is going to be much more purposeful based on the things that they really want to get out of the marketplace. So creativity, brand innovation, ethics, sustainability, those things are going to become even more amplified in today's environment as the consumer has fewer resources with which to spend in the marketplace. So what advice would you give for both retailers and for uh, manufacturers as to how they tap into the new priorities of this new defined consumer? Happy to do that. What I'll do is walk you through sort of real, real broadly four sort of value shifts that are driving new behaviors in the marketplace and talk a little bit about some of the management principles that, that kind of exist. The first large value shift that we're seeing is this move to what we call, David, liquid life. And this is the American desire to move beyond attaining things to attaining liquidity. And so there suddenly is tremendous sort of social currency in being able to be someone who is adaptable, flexible, not weighed down by simply having too much stuff. And this goes in line, obviously, with um, the sort of freelance digital lifestyle that we're all leading, where there's the rise of entrepreneurialism and, and the rise of sort of do it yourself. But that's a real important emphasis here is it's if I have less stuff in my life, I'm much more fluid and flexible, I'm much more adaptable, which allows me to weather the volatility of today. And what we're seeing in some of the behaviors that, that manifest that self is, is a trend that we call déclassé consumption. And this is all about the idea that actually spending money recklessly makes you look uh, essentially out of fashion. We see that evidenced um, in a number of sort of cultural trends in America. One of the more notable ones was that P. Diddy vowed to sort of tone down his bling. Uh, we thought that was quite interesting. But we also have noticed that, 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 uh, the phenomenon. That's very, that's very relative, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, you know, it's, it's interesting. You know, you can go into some shops on Madison Avenue and Fifth Avenue and walk out of a luxury boutique with a brown paper bag to cover your purchases. Now, now that may be the extreme reaction, but there's other things that are more subtle. There's the, the movement toward high-end haggling for luxury goods and real estate. There's also the trend toward, you know, last minute deals that have become very cool, like Woot.com, for example. Um, we also saw at the New York Fashion Show this year that uh, the designer Ducky Brown connected with McDonald's to feed um, Happy Meals to their models. So everyone's kind of making these statements sort of subtly or not subtly about the fact that, that consumption needs to sort of be a little bit more déclassé. But the other part about that that's really interesting is this idea of sort of unwinding your ego. And we see some other really more noted trends, some that are more mainstream, some that are a little bit more further out. But the idea of the fact that you shouldn't place as much emphasis on your own ego and your own importance. So there's this fringe trend that's just emerged um, in California, which is about backyard burials. The idea that all you need is a pine you know, coffin in order to be buried in the backyard to limit your expenses. So th that's far out on the end, I understand. But what, if you pull that back in, what you do see is sort of a great relief to the Great Recession, where consumers are feeling a little bit more relieved that they don't have to keep up with the Joneses, they can spend where their passions are, and they can be a little bit more discriminant. So the, the so, types of so management... So sir, please. So do you see more people doing things from a more individualistic perspective, given that trend? We're going to show you a trend in just a second that's really about the combination of individuals and communities. So it's definitely less about sort of me, 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 and more about we. But the key part of this is the sort of run-up of this debt-fueled consumption was really about how I can sort of, you know, preen and show my individuality. And now what you're seeing is a little bit of this unwinding, as I said, of your ego, where you're dismantling your artifice and you're a little bit more approachable and open, which makes you much more of an effective collaborator in this sort of networked economy. Um, the management principles that do come out of, of this trend, this trend toward liquid life and, and déclassé consumption, is something we call dollars and cents, which is connecting to the consumer not only on a practical level, but on a, on a values level that you get what they're looking for out of the market. 
A couple examples of that would be McDonald's, who's taking on Starbucks right now with their unsnobbycoffee.com, including their digital sort of coffee intervention program. There's other interesting ways that this also kind of takes hold, which is in baseball here, uh, the San Francisco Giants, it's a baseball team in California, has instituted a really innovative process called dynamic pricing that allows ticket holders or, or ticket purchasers rather right up until the minute of, the, of buying a ticket to factor in things like the pitching matchups, the strength of the schedules, even the weather, that's all factored in at the price of the ticket. So it steps back to this whole management principle of needing to be fluid and adaptable as your consumer and finding ways that you can be as dynamic in your business model that you can you know, move with the consumer as they're moving sort of fluidly in the marketplace. Um, other noted trends we see are the movement towards sort of simplicity in ingredients and foods and the focus on, on sort of simple innovation, you know, like the success of the flip phone or the rise of the Tata Nano that's on its way to the United States. So that's the first of sort of four values. Um, I'll go into the second, which is a big movement toward what we call ethics and fair play. Clearly, we need that in the wake of the uh, you know, Bernard Madoff era and, the, and everything else that's happened. But with that comes this desire from a consumer standpoint to want empathy and respect. And what it means for business is that you need to provide both value and values. So in order to really have a transaction with a consumer, a, a precursor to that rather is that you need to have values in your business model, values in your people and what you stand for. So that sort of duality of value and values we're seeing is something that's really kind of tracking in our study. Some examples of empathy and respect, really interestingly, there's a rise of volunteerism in the United States predominantly among unemployed. So unemployed people are getting more active in their social environments. We saw other movements like the rise toward um, backyard gardening and organic farming. Uh, organic um, internships at organic farms are up 30% this year. And then when you take that forward, there's this part of empathy and respect that's really about transparency. Uh, I don't know if you knew this, David, but Gore-Tex now has a policy where they publish on their internal company extranet the expense reports of all of their executives so that everyone can see in a very open way you know the the, the expenses that the, the executives are incurring well that, so, that, that, that must make for some uh, interesting reading well you know it's that larger idea that everything is open and accessible everything needs to be transparent and companies that want to have relationships with consumers realizing that their dollars are now much more focused that they are going to need to provide you know, value as well as values. Um, the kind of ways that we see that manifest itself is a really interesting sort of development where many, many companies are using their internal assets, the infrastructure that they already have, and providing good for the consumer. A couple examples of that would be Microsoft. They just vowed in the United States to train up to 2 million Americans on IT training. And that comes out of the realization that people are going to be retooling, retraining, needing to acquire new knowledge. What Microsoft has done, I, I think brilliantly, is taken assets they already had, redeployed them in a new way. We see that with Walgreens. It's a large um, uh, you know, uh, drugstore here like Boots in the UK. And what Walgreens has done is offered um, free health uh, care coverage and insurance for people that don't have it. Uh, FedEx, for example, with the launch of FedEx Kinko's, is in doing a program offering free resume printing on Tuesdays for job seekers. So again, just really kind of cleverly designed ways that you can connect with your consumer using the assets you already have and realizing that a purchase may not be immediate, but you may be engendering goodwill for the future.